Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to your Scottish Parliament. You are very welcome to this afternoon session of the Festival of, uh, Festival of Politics. My name is Maggie Chapman. I'm one of the Scottish Green MSPs, but for the purposes of this afternoon, I am a member of the Scottish Parliament corporate body and the Scottish Parliament's think tank, the Scottish Fu Scotland's Futures Forum. So you're very welcome to the Festival of Politics. Um, this is our 20th year of the festival where we've had conversations, discussions, debates, sometimes the odd argument or two. But I hope that you've, you, you've been involved today, you've, you, you've enjoyed what, what's happening uh, around the building already, and that you're looking forward to this afternoon's discussion. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions later, so we'll have a, a bit of a conversation first, but th then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and, and join in some of that conversation. So in the session, we're talking about the US elections, uh, Trump or Harris, in partnership with the University of Glasgow. And um, we're also asking if you are able to or, or willing to do pop things up on, on social media. Our Twitter handle or X um, is visit Scott Powell. And on Instagram, we are at Scott Powell. So, so please, please do make use of that if you can. And there'll also be an, an opportunity to, to, to see some, some bits and pieces from the Festival of Politics on our YouTube channel later on, um, in, late, later this month, I, I imagine. I'm also very grateful we're joined by Shora Dixon and Jenny Laird, who are, are our BSL interpreters for this session today. So very pleased that we have a fantastic panel um, who will be uh, contributing this afternoon. I welcome Jason Box, Robert Moran and Nomia Iqbal, who's joining us live from Washington, D.C. Jason is a partner at RXN Group in Washington, D.C. He has worked in public affairs and opinion research for more than 20 years with expertise in communications and digital research, reputation and brand management, campaign and message development and political strategy. Robert is a partner at the Brunswick Group, a critical issues advisory firm in Washington, D.C. He's man a management consultant, communications strategist, futurist and writer. His new novel, Lincoln 2.0, which explores a, a near future of AI candidates, has been recently published. Nomia Iqbal is the BBC's News North, sorry, North American correspondent. Uh, she was previously a presenter at BBC Five Live and for the BBC World Service's Newsday, an international early morning news and current affairs global programme. Nomi has also worked as a trainer and producer at BBC Media Action, working in Zambia, Tanzania and Zanzibar. So please join me in welcoming our panel this afternoon. So to get things going, Things have been quite interesting in the US elections in, in, in the last few weeks. A few, bits, a few changes, a few ups and downs. Numia, can I, if I can come to you first, what, what have been the ups and downs the, the, of the last few, few weeks? Where are we with the US elections? Um, yeah, very good question. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for, um, for, for today's event. Um, well, it's so interesting because when the we knew the presidential debate was happening, and there's this, I'm sure... Um, you know, my, my fellow panelists can sort of maybe agree with this. There's this kind of belief amongst journalists, certainly in DC, that presidential debates don't really change anything. Um, but certainly, you know, modern in modern times that, you know, they're entertaining, they allow, you know, people to kind of get a sense of who the candidates are, but they don't change much. Obviously, that's now completely out the window because what happened on June the 27th changed the course of history. I think there was a sense that Biden would stand down um, he'd been stubborn for quite some time, uh, but he did. Uh, he eventually stood down, but we also had the Trump assassination attempt. There was the RNC. There was just so much going on that I was talking to a colleague about what could the October surprise be. So this is something that, you know, happens a month before the election, which kind of skews the race a bit. But we, we just couldn't work out what that possibly could be. I mean, there might still be something that could happen, but it has been really just insanely like eventful and i think we're at this stage now where we're just trying to make sense of where the race is at 
you know, is it Donald Trump's to lose? Is it Kamala Harris's to lose? So um, it's it's just it, I think I think the whole thing has just been re-energized because previously the polls did suggest that a lot of Americans were just not enthused about this election. It's a rematch of Trump and Biden. But obviously now that's completely changed. Robert, do you agree? Uh, what, what, what have been your highs or, or, or lows of the last few months? Weeks? It has been possibly the most sort of momentous couple months that I can think of in U.S. politics, at least since maybe the end of communism, fall Berlin Wall. I mean, it's been pretty crazy. Um, I do think it is Trump's race to lose at this point. I suspect that if I were to give those sort of percentages... I think there's a 60% chance that it's a tight race, essentially a coin flip, and we're going to talk a lot more about the dynamics of that. I think it's a 30% chance that the wheels fall off the Harris campaign and he wins of 290 to 310 electoral votes, give or take, and a 10% chance that she does well and he blows himself up. You've moderated a little. Yeah, no, I think that's about right. Yeah, no, I'm with you on the 10%. I think there's a chance that he just mismanages it, but... Um, these races, I always look at the incumbent first because I think the incumbent's behavior is the most important and decisive to win, especially in our system, in the American system. And then I just leave it with the economy. Perceptions of the economy are usually decisive in an American election. Perceptions of the economy are net, net negative right now. Um, and that would then be good for Trump and bad for Harris. But we don't know how those get priced in with everything else yet. Yeah. Jason, Trump's to lose? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it is. Um, I take some personal blame because I was here in August of 2016. A few of you were there, I think. Uh, and I very boldly predicted that Hillary Clinton would be the president. Actually, I think I said there's no way Donald Trump will become the president. So my apologies to uh, all of Scotland and the world. Um, uh, yeah, Trump, Trump, it is Trump's to lose, less because of um, what an outstanding candidate he is, uh, but just he has this, uh, this base of support, this enthusiasm of the 30-some percent of Americans who simply can't get enough of him. Uh, I think he jokingly said once he could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody. Um, he he still can do that, and he would probably gain some votes. Um, I think the 60, 30, 10 is maybe it's 55, 25, 20. Um, but I do think that uh, probabilistically it's Trump's to lose. And, and what, I mean, with, with Biden standing down eventually... And, and the assassination attempt that uh, uh, Nomi mentioned. How important are those two events at shifting things, if at all? Well, they whipsawed us completely. I mean, the assassination attempt, remember, that happened first. Yeah. Remember, the, the, well, the debate happened first, or whatever you want to call that. It wasn't much of a debate, but it happened. It was obviously bad for Biden. Then the assassination attempt happened. Trump got a little bit of a bump, like a sympathy bump from that, but... As we're going to talk later about this, like Trump has essentially a ceiling on his vote, so it was bumping up against that ceiling. He gets a bump, and then the Democrats make a, a, a change with their standard bearer, and that whipsawed the race again. So you had three basic whipsaws in like a really good three weeks or whatever it was. It's nuts. And how? I mean, how, how do those, those events change people's perception of the elections, people's perception of, of what was possible? Well, two of those three events had a much different impact than the third. They're bookended, right? So uh, June 27th, debates now matter, um, that there were a sizable percentage of Democrats who were just completely unenthusiastic about Biden. More than not still liked Biden and preferred Biden, but there was a not insignificant minority of Democrats who were just really uh, unenthusiastic about their choices. So that huge event. Especially younger Democrats. Especially younger Democrats. Um, my two daughters, who are as liberal as the day is long, uh, just were not excited about Joe Biden at all. He was older than their granddad, so it just didn't make any sense to them. Um, obviously, Biden stepping down 
t completely again changes the race. I'm. Uh, it was remarkable to me. I was doing daily polling um, right around the time when Trump was assassinated uh, or the attempted assassination. <laughs> um, are we off the record? Uh, yeah. um, I was, it was remarkable to me that he only got about a two-point bump. And I, I think it speaks to a point that, that Bob made earlier. His numbers are baked in. There isn't really a lot more than he can do to change people's minds. Uh, the, the, the room to grow is uh, much more favorable for Kamala than it is for Trump. Trump really can't grow much more, um, which makes the next 60 days uh, critical. I, I'd just like to wish everyone a happy one-month anniversary of the candidacy of Kamala Harris. It's been exactly one month. Is that right? Or 10 years, however you're feeling. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. It's been a month. I think it's remarkable to me that you know, you would think that the Trump campaign would have had a strategy if the Democrats did a, did a switcheroo. Mm -hmm. They they didn't appear, they don't appear to have had a strategy, mm -hmm. uh, at least from my seeing. And I've been for background. I worked on the Republican side. Jason worked on the Democratic side. I've said a lot of not unkind things about Donald Trump here in this venue in past years, which you can Google. Uh, but so there's a, a diversity of opinion even on the Republican side about him. But um, but I was surprised that they didn't appear to have a much crisper strategy to define Harris quickly. And we're going to talk a lot more about that because I think that's the opportunity space for them is to define her well to the left of the median swing voter. I just wanted to add... Um, at the RNC, I, and this was after the, the uh, presidential debate, after the assassination attempt, uh, when I spoke to a lot of the delegates, when I spoke to various lawmakers about Biden potentially standing out, I think there was a sense of they didn't believe it would happen. Um, they, they, they structured Donald Trump's re-election campaign entirely around Biden. And I mean, even now, it feels like Donald Trump is has lost his soulmate. You know, the way he talks about Joe Biden, that, you know, this was the man that he was expecting to run against. And I think that especially if you look at the way Biden was speaking in his interviews, he almost became a little bit Trumpian. He was like, uh, you know, unless God says that I can't run anymore and I'm the one that can save democracy, you know, that that sort of talk. I think there was a belief uh, in the Republican Party that he won't stand down. And uh, there were many, you know, uh, you know, as I said, delegates and Republican Party supporters who were convinced that he'd stay. So I, I, I don't know. I, I just wonder if they they didn't believe it would happen. And, and in, in those conversations, I mean, they didn't believe it would happen. Was anybody thinking about the possibility that there might be somebody else there that that actually Biden wouldn't? wouldn't make it for for reasons of God or, 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 or otherwise. I mean, I speaking to people, I think there was a sense that, oh, it can't be Kamala Harris because she her approval ratings were so low. I mean, you know, you've got to remember Harris's presidential campaign went nowhere. Uh, she just wasn't seen as making an impact. And th there was no sense that she could, even though it's logical that the VP would have probably would have, you know, taken over Biden uh, and they were just I think not thinking beyond President Biden I, I think they just that's what I that's what that's the sense that I certainly got from the Republican National Convention thanks so this is a I hope this helps the the audience so um the the two parties have nominating rules they they're political parties and they have a number of rules that are their machinery um, the Republicans, the machinery of the party hasn't changed very much since the end of the Civil War. On the Republicans, How which, their <laughs> well, their views are what won the, their views are what won the Civil War. But, but the Republican Party has very a, a very small number of delegates um, that are basically set to the electoral votes of those states. So they don't have as many delegates, and the rules are. Are a little bit more limiting. The Democratic uh, National Committee has a much larger number of delegates, and the rules have changed a few times. Most notably, what was it, sixty-eight, when the Democrats changed the rules Johnson, a bunch, yeah. and then they reach, and then they changed them again in the early eighties. I think with the super delegates. Oh, Isn't I'm hardly right? old enough to remember that part. So <laughs> the, the Democrats have changed the the rules a little bit. So I think from the Republican perspective, I think we we knew that Biden was a 
was not a great candidate. Um, but we and we thought that Democrats might want to change their their nominee, but we didn't think that they could based on the machinery and the rules of the system. And I think that was probably us thinking about our own rules of like what we've got in the in how our conventions work. So I think the, the dem- general view on the Republican side was they can't do a switcheroo because like the delegates are ple- they were pledged delegates. Right. So that was, I think, the theory. But, you know, you it's all the rules, man. The rules are clear that there's no nominee until there's a nominee. Uh, was, and actually, Biden played this brilliantly. If you give him the, cre- the benefit of the doubt um, that he not only chose the time of his own demise, um, but that he actually wasn't pushed out, right? which I, I agree. I don't think he was pushed out. Um, but the, the timing of when he decided to step down was brilliant. Um, it was probably a five, the value of like a $500 million step out because the entire Republican convention – and the weeks leading up to the convention when the party was really ramping up its public communications was all about Biden. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, for most of us on the inside, we all saw this as Biden couldn't win, not because of his policies or even his legacy, but because he was Biden, simply because he was Biden. And that was Trump's argument. You can't vote for Biden. He didn't, I mean, there's no policy there. I mean, he has articulated a couple of policies here and there, but at the end of the day, he was running on, on the strength of his personality and the, his appeal within the party. Um, there's no campaign because they didn't think they needed a campaign. His campaign is rolling out in front of his golf courses and saying how old Biden is. And when Biden stepped out, that was a, it was a kneecap uh, to so, his so, candidacy. So what's the role there of, of donations? Because that, that's something that's so different in, in, in British politics, that the, the value the value placed on on donations, and you said half a billion? Well, so in the 30 days since Kamala became the the presumptive nominee, uh, she is, uh, it was just reported this morning, or yet I can't, the time difference makes me all crazy. Um, At some point in the last 24 hours, uh, she's raised $500 million. Just her in 30 days, most of which are small dollar donations. So I know this is a really crazy thing for you all to contemplate. we, uh, we, we, it's as hard for you as it is for us to understand what a short election looks like, which well, we, is kind of nice. We have now. a hard time understanding publicly funded races, uh, right? So. Uh, but the money matters. Uh, Kamala just put in. Uh, I'm sorry, I should say, the vice president uh, just put in a 300 million dollar ad buy for the month of September. 200 million of which is digital, which is a real departure That's from what we've done in the past. Um, it's it's almost like monopoly money at this point. I mean, just light it on a fire and you know light your cigarettes with it and just throw it away. Uh, I mean, the, the money that's like a whole another panel is the the role of money in, in elections and how bad it is. American politics has always been marinated in cash, um, and so like even one of our founding fathers, George Washington, he was he owned the largest distillery in the colonies than the states and used it to to get votes. I mean, he had free booze at his rallies. So um, so we've always had a very open-ended sort of fundraising system. I don't have a problem with it, I think, but, you know, it's so just, it is what it is. So but, but Harris will have a cash advantage over Trump, a fundraising For advantage. Sure. Yeah. For sure. Given what you say about money being a whole, whole other panel, I'm wondering, we've talked about age. What, what kind of how much does age actually matter in in the, in the politics, in in the policies, or in in the perception and appearance of, of of candidates? Because obviously, if that was was Trump's campaign, you know, Biden, he's old, he's mumbling, he's incoherent. You can't you, you can't vote for him. How that it, that has been completely f- flipped on its head because he he can't say that about Harris. Well, he is now officially the oldest nominated major party candidate for president. Is that right? Oh, yeah. 79 years old. He is officially the oldest. So my have the tables turned. And, um, and what does that do to voting blocks and, and, and people who might – does it have an impact on younger voters? Are younger voters more likely to vote for Harris? Uh, vote, or are younger people more likely to, to turn out and vote at all? Uh, how, how, how does that – no, Nomia, do you want to come in on, on that? Um, yeah, you know, like, 
that that was the big advantage that Trump certainly had over Biden, that he's old, he's uh, mumbling, he's decrepit and all that kind of thing. And now he looks very old and mumbly and what have you. But I think I'd probably say that, that America's used to having older politicians. You know, there, there's this whole thing about the gerontocracy in this country. Um, I, I would go a bit further and say I think it's the way she's running her campaign at the moment. It's. It's more forward thinking in some respects, like even her slogans, you know, choose freedom as opposed to democracies at stake, which I think democracy at stake was always a bit of a nebulous argument. I, I remember being on the road and uh, in, you know, various covering various events and, and talking to people about that. They weren't quite sure what that meant, because as far as they were concerned, yes, January the 6th was awful. And obviously there's so many people in this country who think that you know, who who believe in what Donald Trump says about January the 6th. But they also look at it in that, well, America survived. And, you know, Joe Biden became president. Our institutions, they, you know, we we managed to to get past it is is the way they think. Um, the, the people that I've spoken to. And and then you and, and then the other problem was that you had Republicans that were co-opting that message as well, saying democracy is at stake, saying, well, yes, um, Joe Biden didn't win the election, um, you know, legitimately, even though there's never been any evidence that they presented to, to show that. And then she also has this other slogan, which I don't think is her official slogan, but it's not going back. So I think there's all there's this this sort of image that she's presenting, which makes her look young, vibrant. And she's obviously much younger than Trump. Um and and joyous and you know tim walls made that point thank you for bringing the joy back and so donald trump is now looking to to many voters and the independents are the ones that are you know pretty significant here especially in the swing states that he he's the one that looks a bit old and a bit gloomy and a bit doomy a bit miserable he doesn't really smile much whether or not she can continue that momentum though that's 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 the other issue yeah, and I think it's hard to continue that momentum. So the the math is, there's what, 30-some percent that really don't have a good sense 36. of her? 36%. Don't have a really good sense of her. That's not her fault. It's the nature of the vice presidency in our system. You don't really know a lot about the vice president. They don't get as much news. So I think, to I think right now, I think it was David Axelrod on the Democratic side that said, watch out, this is kind of a sugar high. Um, so I think the... The Trump folks will try to define her to the left of the median swing voter in a, in a handful of states because that's where these, this election will be decided. Um, and I suspect that she'll fall to earth uh, a little bit and that that will then cost her the election. Um, her voting record is, depending on the year, the second or the fourth most liberal in the Senate – so they have plenty of work to work with. They have a lot of video they can use for attack ads and things like that. I'm sure they'll use them. Um, and so I think that's, that's what happens. If you look at it, this time during the Clinton-Hillary-Trump, uh, she was up, what, six points nationally? Nationally is not a good game. Now you're just rubbing it in. Yeah, yeah, she was up six points roughly. Yeah. yeah. So like, and I think that Harris to win in the Electoral College needs to be up three but you think higher? Yeah. Okay. So right now she's up 1.2. Call it two. Split two? Yeah. Okay. So right now she's up two. That's tight. And one of the one of the challenges I think the Harris team has is that they have a lot of, you know, air quotes, wasted votes in New York and California. They're going to win those states. They're going to win those states going away. Those votes, they get those electoral votes, but, you know, th so they get a higher popular vote number, but they don't that those will translate. So I think that's a, that's a little bit, that's what we're talking about. So we're not really talking about the big national election here. We're talking really about seven states? Seven states. Seven states. Yeah. Tell us a bit, a bit about those states then, Jason. So Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin in the Midwest. And then, what do you call them? I the, call them the Troublesome the Four. The Troublesome Four. I, I love, I, I call them the Sun Belt states. <laughs> Uh, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. Those are those are the seven states. That's the ball game. And really, really, the ball game is Pennsylvania. Um, if Kamala wins Pennsylvania, then not much else really matters in terms of the election. The day after the election is a whole another story. 
Uh, but it really is going to come down to those seven states, and really it's going to come down to Pennsylvania. Can I ask you a question, though? Do you think she could win Pennsylvania but lose Wisconsin or Michigan? No. Right. No. It seems like it would be... E like she can lose Pennsylvania and win right. those two states. But not the reverse. She can't win it's, Pennsylvania. It's, right. yeah, yeah. That, it's, that, okay. it's like a square is not a rectangle. Right? That's right. Yeah, it I doesn't agree. work that I think, way. I think that's right. Um, yeah. And then there's a whole debate about who she picked for vice president. Why didn't she pick the very popular governor of Pennsylvania? Why did she pick the former football coach from Minnesota? This is we don't disagree on a whole lot. We disagree on that. So we disagree on this, but we don't want to waste your time talking about vice presidential picks because it's boring. And uh, I, I have a certain view that both picks were bad, but we don't want to. We don't want to. You just don't so, want to talk about JD Vance. Let's, uh, let's. So the, it's biographical. JD Vance is from Ohio, like me. He was born thirty miles from where I was born. I want to like him. I wanted to like his speech. I hated his speech, so uh, I didn't like I his speech at all. I was going to say, though, I, I was going to say, you know, you're right, like vice presidents, who cares about them? But actually, they have become quite significant, though, haven't they, if you think about it? Like, you know, Kamala Harris is now the nominee, and Donald Trump, I know, you know, the attempted assassination was before he picked his VP, but imagine if that had happened afterwards and something, he had been assassinated, suddenly VPs yeah. are probably a little bit more important than usual. And Walt seems to have captured something, certainly how, it, how we see it relayed, captured something that has, has been part of the change in the tone and the, the, the nature of, of Harris's campaign. Well, no? since, since Trump came into political, um, into the part of our conversation, there has been this increasing, I think you've experienced it here as well, um, particularly in the last couple of weeks with all the riots uh, down south in the latter part of the, the lesser part of the UK. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is this real toxic masculinity that has become part and parcel of our political process. Um, for me, Tim Walls is the antidote. Uh, he's he's all of the memes. He's the the he's the dad bod and the dad jokes, and he's the football coach who's friends to the gay and lesbian community. He is the soft. He takes the toxic out of toxic masculinity in a way that I think makes. Kamala more appealing, and this is where we disagree, I think that Walls helps her in those other states more than Shapiro would have, because Shapiro is very type A, he's an alpha, he's going to be a presidential candidate someday, he wants the job, he can't get away from appearing that way, and I don't mean that pejoratively, he's just, he's like another kind of Obama type. It feels very um, Roman, doesn't it? It does. Like the person that wants it too much, he, the exactly, that wants it too they just much push him to the side. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tim Walls is approachable, and I think yeah. that he can speak for Kamala in a non-toxic way among less educated, middle, lower middle class, working white men. <laughs> Uh, in a way that I don't think Shapiro would have connected with outside of Pennsylvania. I think race is something we haven't really talked about that much. How how big a how big of an issue is is that? Do you think it's big? It's huge. I, I mean, if I only listened to Donald Trump, I would think that this is nothing but a conversation about race. There's only one candidate on the campaign trail right now talking about race, and that's Donald Trump. Trump, yeah. I mean, Mummy, if you want to come in, come in on, on this. Um, with race, the, the, the interesting thing is that I, I don't think she has made it such a big focal point of her campaign that I've seen, but Donald Trump seems slightly obsessed with it. I mean, he had that slightly, what was it, disastrous um, conference with the, uh, with the black journalists uh, here, and he made a point of how... Oh, she's now she's now identifying as Indian, I think, or she was not identified. I mean, Kamala Harris has always been very open about her biracial identity. And I think it just made him look so out of touch because I, I think there's more than 33 million Americans who identify as biracial, or multiracial. And it's, it's not actually a, a big issue, I would say. I mean, I'd be interested to know what, you know, you guys think, but like even... You know, when I first came to America four years ago, one thing that I really find quite um, quite lovely about Americans is that they like to tell you their heritage. They like to say, oh, I'm, you know, quarter Irish, third Scottish, I'm fifth, you know, that sort of connection to the old world. I, you know, it's it's kind of a normal thing. So when he talks about it, 
I just think it, it makes him look out of touch and doesn't really connect with younger voters. Um, uh, him making a big issue out of it. I mean, even like people like Kellyanne Conway, his former uh, press secretary, has said, you know, less of the personal insults, more on the policy and what have you. I, I don't think that that it's working for him. I mean, you you know, you guys can probably have more sort of data on on just what impact that makes. I think it does well with his base. But as you said, there's a ceiling there. Think so. I think the last two questions were about um, VP choice and about uh, ethnicity, and I think that in reality, you know, there's signal and there's noise, and I think the signal, I think it's going to be the perceptions of the economy. I think that's you know that's that's the battlefield, the the fair punk, you know, that's the that's the thing. I think the other stuff is a little bit more of a distraction. And the, the, the ethnicity is interesting because America's a melting pot and people are from all kinds of I would, religions and yeah, ethnicities. I would agree with you were it not for the fact that Biden was only polling at around 70% with black, Ameri- with black yeah. voters. Yeah, yeah. And you start to talk about this or the composition of the U.S. electorate. Yeah. Uh, it's still an overwhelmingly white country. Uh, Democrats generally get, what, 30, 35% of the white vote? Uh, and typically get north of 85% of the black vote. And if that, the, the calculus changes, right? Yeah. So the more that that Trump is undisciplined in his message. By the way, side note, your vice presidential candidate is married to an Indian yeah. woman. I yeah. mean, what are you doing? Um, but as long as he stays undisciplined, the we're talking about margins of points here. So if you go from 70% to 80% to 85 or 90%, even though that's with a group that's considerably smaller in the electorate, every vote matters. And side note, lots of black folk live in Pennsylvania and Michigan and North Carolina and Georgia, right. and one or two points here and there will make a difference. So the way Jason and I think about – so we both started life as, as political pollsters, and so we both did – vote share calculations and turnout calculations for our candidates. That's what you do when you're a younger person working at polling firms. It's one of the first jobs they put you on. You go blind looking at Excel, Excel basically. <laughs> but so the way we think about it is there's the percentage of a population in our census, all different subgroups, a percentage of the population, but then there's the, then, but there's the percentage that are expressed in the vote. So there's, ter- there's the actual percent that are turning out and what percentage they make up of the electorate, and then their contribution, their marginal, the, the, the margin they give. And so what Jace is talking about is very important. Basically, the, if you're running a campaign from the Democratic side, you need to really get very, very high margins uh, out of the black vote, but you also need a high percent. You, you need turnout, you and, turn margin. out and margin. So we think yeah. about turnout times margin, right? So if, you, if that makes sense mathematically, and so that's what it. And what Jason is saying is one hundred percent correct. Like I think Harris does better for Democrats with black voters and probably higher turnout and better margin. So that, that would be an improvement. Right. Which changes the equation. That would be an improvement I over just- Biden. I just wanted to ask you both as well, you know, it, you know, it's always, I always trying to rationalize Trump's stra- approach and, and, and think, is there a strategy to any of this? So when he does attack Kamala Harris over switching her identity, as he claims that she does, is, is, this, is there a sense that he thinks he's playing smart politics, that this is trying to paint her as, as phony, as, inauthentically black could that resonate with black voters especially you know young men who we know there's an increasing number who support donald trump i just i just wonder if if there is some sort of strategy there uh, that that he (laughs) thinks i mean i mean i know i mean i I always try to sort of like i mean i don't know if i'm wasting my time but like trying to rationalize what he does because he is he does have good instincts doesn't he i mean i think we can't say that about he does and and you know underestimate him at your own peril um i I don't think it's a a racial thing i do think it's strategic in that he knows how to get at the underbelly of an of of an opponent 
and to create confusion or a lack of trust or to muddy up the water in a way that keeps he's like a like a boxer with lots of jabs you know he doesn't really have any real like roundhouses left but he's got lots of jabs and if he can the more that Kamala talks about her race or anyone on her behalf, the less they're talking about her forward-looking vision and that cut, that accrues to his benefit. Uh, he's not a strategy guy, uh, I, but, I, but he does know people. Um, again, I, 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 I made the mistake of underestimating him once, uh, never again. So I think one of the reasons why we underestimated him in 2016 is he was not a 20th or 21st century politician. He's a night, and I've said this a lot, but he's a 19th century politician. He loves big rallies. He loves traveling around and speaking to big rallies, right? And um, keep in mind, this is a man that ever since he was young was used to working the media, talking to journalists about his real estate ventures, everything else. So the way he operates is when he's at his rallies, he's essentially like a comedian trying new material. I don't mean he's a comic. I'm saying he's trying new material, he's testing it, and he's seeing if it works, if it gets applause lines. He's like, ah, oh, that's a good one. And so he's constantly sort of like reassessing what he's doing and using his rallies as a feedback loop. Now, I'm not sure they're a great feedback loop because they're well, they're kind of folks that, right, <laughs> it's already a self-selected group of people. So I would use polling and focus groups for that but but whatever but i think but what's interesting is if you listen to his so on one hand he he, he's he is in no way like the way we advised candidates when we were running campaigns we wanted a clear strategy that was mathematically driven that had message discipline robotic like message discipline i repeat over and over these same lines until they're sort of arc welded into the or onto the body politic he doesn't operate that way. He operates as a 19th century politician. He's trying different things out. You know, he's a pugilist. And if it works, he keeps going and he keeps trying new material. So I don't even know what to do with that, right? Like that's, Just we're not, and this is, the, and but this is the problem. This is the problem media and his media has had covering him and opponents have had is he's not a, the average or normal politician that they've dealt with. It's a weird animal to deal with in the body politic. If, if I'm Kamala and her team, I just ignore them. Honestly, just ignore them. She's talked about the 36% of Americans who don't yet really know what she stands for. Focus on them. They, everyone, you said it, no one's changing their mind about Donald Trump. No one's going to wake up tomorrow, see a commercial, and go, oh, my God, what a great, I totally changed my mind. on." I no one's doing, doing that. that. about Donald Trump. Nobody's doing that. Uh, so they need to focus on her and her vision and her history and her, uh, her resume and just ignore him, uh, which is hard because it's, it's hard to ignore the, you know, the, the fly that keeps buzzing around your face. It's hard to ignore that. Fly that keeps buzzing around your face. They, they, there's an image. I'm going to open it up to questions or, or comments. I, I, I'll take two or three hands. Um, we've got microphones coming, so please do wait for a microphone to come to you before you, you speak. Um, and if you can keep your questions or comments brief, then we can get in a few more a few more people. A, ha a couple of hands towards the front, if I can. They, they were the ones I saw first. Have we got a microphone? In a minute. Microphone's on its way. On its way. While we're waiting for, for, for the microphone, I'm, I, I'm just wondering, does the fact that Donald Trump ha has been convicted and, and he's a convicted felon, does that make a difference to anybody, it you think? We wouldn't, we wouldn't even be here talking about Donald Trump if he hadn't had the legal problems. I've said this on TV a million times. Like, basically... DeSantis, like his opponents, looked better in the Republican primary before all of his legal problems. The legal problems created sympathy for the it among, it, it, yeah. right. It validated what he was saying, so it created sympathy. So his legal problems actually helped reinforce. So basically, his voter base started to look at him like like voters in other countries would look at like an embattled opposition leader who's being targeted by the. The regime or something. So that's what he used to his advantage. And that's how, in fact, there was a rally effect to him. And that's how he won the primary. If, if he didn't have the legal problems, he probably would have lost the primary. Because oh. Republicans, well, there was 50% looking for somebody else. 
I remember two years ago we were th- we were talking about hmm they're looking around for who else they can go with but the legal problems it also sucked all the oxygen out of the room every day was about Trump in court right well I think the legal problems are part of the reason why he's running <laughs> I mean, it's all it's all one big Gordian knot at this point um, towards the front um, the third third row a person just on the end with her hand up yep. Hi, uh, thank you. I'd like to ask Nomia and uh, the panel, um, just on a fundamental basis, you've been talking about differences in age, you've been talking about the ethnicity and how that's going to swing the vote in seven swing states, but like, fundamentally, are Americans over themselves enough to vote for a woman as their leader, just on that base level? Uh, shall we take a couple of questions and, and, and um, just uh, along here and then on the other side? Third row back. Thanks. We're an hour in and nobody's mentioned abortion. Could you give us some comments on how influential you think? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. So that's good. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, just the third row back, third seat in. Uh, thank you, Maggie. Uh, David Stewart, former member of Scottish Parliament. Can I first of all thank the three panellists for their excellent contribution? Could I just ask a simple question about defence? And the new president in January, what will the approach be to NATO and specifically about the war in Ukraine and the effect? on Russian invasion of Ukraine? So, women and defence. Well, Nomia, yeah. you want to go first? Um, with, the, with the woman one, um, I was, we were just chatting beforehand, weren't we, um, and talking about whether America is ready for a woman. And, I, you know, I think that... when I Well, look, I can say anecdotally, when I've... Um, you know, when I was at the Harris Waltz rally and what have you, of course, those are people who support them both. They they felt that it it was kind of they 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 didn't think it was a big deal, um, and I, I think a lot of that is because Kamala herself hasn't really made being a woman a big center piece of her campaign. Um, I'll let you both um, talk about that a bit more on the abortion thing. I think she's way stronger on it than than President Biden. President Biden always seemed a bit uncomfortable talking about abortion. There was um, you know, this, this this sort of assumption that as a Catholic he didn't really like it, and but he he knew politically it was advantageous. Whereas Kamala Harris has made it a centerpiece. She went on a big tour last year, I think, of um, re- reproductive rights. Uh, she's talked a lot about it. Her whole choosing freedom slogan is based around that. And she generally, again, you know, you guys probably have the data for it. She. She is someone who is seen as much stronger on the issue of abortion. She can she can really crystallise that message, perhaps in a way that that I think President Biden couldn't always do. Do you want Do you want to respond or sure? Add? I, love, I love talking about you know politics and women as a older white man. Um, <laughs> uh, you could argue that America was a ready was ready for a female president in twenty sixteen. They just weren't weren't ready for a Hillary female president in 2016. I think if if that had been a different female candidate, um, we wouldn't have been talking about a first President Trump. Uh, I absolutely think that we're ready for a woman president. Um, the great and interesting thing about Kamala, as she is so undefined still, that she doesn't necessarily have to talk about things. She signals just by virtue of being a woman. Uh, she signals that this is okay, that this is a, a positive thing. Um, I, as a father of two died in the wool liberal daughters uh, who had zero enthusiasm for Joe Biden, they're going to go out door knocking for Kamala. Uh, they couldn't be more excited. It's connected to abortion um, because... Uh, the Dobbs decision was just a disaster for Republicans. It was a disaster for humans, uh, but it was a, I think it was a disaster for... But now you've got uh, the abortion issue popping up in a number of different states that's going to make it easier for Democrats like John Tester in Montana to get reelected. So I think um, we saw it in the 2022 election where there was just a wave of female turnout, largely because of Dobbs. Um, uh, a third of Americans don't even know what Kamala's position is on abortion, but they assume, as a Democratic female presidential candidate, right. that she's going to be, um, I shouldn't curse, a heck of a lot better on that issue than uh, Donald Trump. So, uh, yeah, uh, abortion's, abortion's going to be a huge thing, 
but she doesn't have to talk about it for it to be a huge thing. Uh, it's already being felt at the grassroots level. So um, first to address the question around female leadership, I think uh, at the state le and federal level, Americans are already electing female governors and female senators, right? Alabama has a female governor. Um, if you go back to two the year 2000, Elizabeth Dole was going to run, was trying to run for president. George W. Bush beat her in the primary and she dropped out. But so we've already, I think that ship has sailed, I think. And Hillary got a majority of the vote nationally, but she just didn't win in the electoral college. So Americans, I think, have already, that, that's moved on. In terms of abortion, it's, it's very interesting. Um, as you all know, the Dobbs decision threw abortion back into the states. So conservatives, it's, conservatives were kind of like the dog that chases the car and then catches the car and then doesn't know what to do. So conservatives, well, conservatives have always said that they wanted abortion to be decided by the people at the state level. They felt that the Supreme Court ruling way back when, the Roe ruling, short-circuited democracy. They wanted it to be decided at the state level. So they got, they got their wish. And so, but politically, it's a problem for them in a number of states. So it's sort of like, you know, it's, sometimes you get what you want, and it's, yeah. that maybe is good politically for you. And, and that's, but that's what happens. Yeah, yeah and let's be clear. The, 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 percentage of the, the percentage of Americans, that we used to call them double haters. We used to, like it was so long ago. Weeks ago, when we had these double haters where uh, you, they didn't like Biden and they didn't like Trump, and it was a pretty significant percentage, they are generally pro-choice. They just uh, they just couldn't bring themselves to vote for Biden. So I think that uh, the abortion issue particularly will be important in yeah. in that ten percent of the vote that they're fighting for. Here's how I think the math works. We're going to talk about NATO. Don't worry. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk, talk about, about NATO. That. We'll we'll get to NATO all yeah. together in a second. And Lily wants to come in before we do. So, so I just I just wanted to add something on the on the you know is America ready for a woman? I wonder. You know, it's more than just a, for her it's, as a woman, isn't it? It's the fact that she's a woman of, of colour. And I, I do wonder if, if for, in a sense, the hurdles are seen as probably slightly higher for her than it would be for a white woman. And then on top of that, the fact that she's a Democrat. I, I think I always... I always thought if, if America does elect a female president, it would be a Republican woman, that America might be more comfortable with a conservative woman in, in office than, than a liberal one. So I, I, I wonder if that's, if, if that's the, the sort of the discussion, really, if it's possible for a biracial Democratic woman to become the president of the U.S. Did you want to say anything else yeah, on this before the, we move? The mathematics uh, of the abortion issue are very interesting. So net-net, mo a majority of Americans, depending on who asks the question, but a majority of Americans would, broadly speaking, be classified as pro-choice. Okay? Then when you follow up with sort of what restrictions they would be in favor of by, by weeks of gestation and everything, it, get, it starts to get complex when you get down to the state level. But it looks like what will happen over time is in state after state after state, the legislature, the governor, the people will come to some kind of a middle ground position that while not everybody is happy with in that state, will reflect the views of the people of that state. It may be more restrictive or less restrictive, but it's probably somewhere in the 14 to 20 week kind of range in most states, not the big blue states. But like... That's what's that's what or we're looking at, like Florida, where it's six weeks. Right. We don't, but but that's going to be adjudicated over the next couple elections until it reaches some kind of stasis, and then people kind of debate that. Um, or so I think when President Kamala Harris federally codifies the right for women to choose, you could yeah. try to do a federal law trial. Right. So I think, but mathematically, I think that um, the abortion issue is very important for the Harris campaign. They need it. They need to use it to run up the score with white college-educated women uh, in the suburbs in order to offset losses, marginal losses with blue-collar men and Latin voters. Is what I think they need to do. So I think they need to use that abortion issue to their advantage. They won't talk about it in broad 
you know, like large language, I don't think. But they're going to do a lot of direct mail, a lot of a lot of social the media level, or right. at the organize the organize a lot of level. targeted yeah. media, right? And and so I think that's a very important strategy for them is how much can they run up the score with white college educated women? I think it's a, it's a big question. Uh, so NATO is going to take us out of NATO, uh, and anybody else will not. <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's pretty. It's a pretty stark. I mean, Trump has made no bones that he was not interested in staying in NATO, growing NATO. Um, he's cozying up with all the wrong people. I think he's terrible for for uh, multi you know, multilateral uh, organizations. Uh, the UN, NATO, take your pick, any of the acronyms. Uh, I think he's he. I think he. I don't think he pulls us out of NATO. Yeah. I think he just freezes it. So I think that, um, you know, if you have a democratic administration, it, it much more engaged with transnational institutions. I think that's obvious. I think um, what's happening with the Republicans is essentially they're, as a party and a brand, they're reformulating to what they were between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Great Depression, which is nationalistic protectionist and isolationist, or more isolationist, right? And so I, that's what you're saying. I don't think he would. I don't think he can take the U.S. out of NATO because that would require the Senate and all sorts of other machinery. I don't think that's yeah, was, that's he not. He just allowed. He just complain it. about it. He and it by ignoring. You it. would hear a lot of the similar arguments that were made back in the '80s about burden sharing, which you can Google. Even Gary Hart talked about burden sharing back in the '80s. So I, I think you get a lot of burden sharing discussions. I think, but I think Ukraine is a very interesting one, and this is something that Jason and I were talking about a lot is what, uh, maybe not an October surprise, but what are the exogenous events that would impact the campaign? One could be a, ba a quick deceleration of the economy. That would have a big impact. But then there are two foreign policy things that could happen that would have a big impact. One would be if, if uh, the Ukraine has quite a bit of success on the battlefield versus Russia, or if the Russian army starts to implode, that would be very good for the Harris campaign. Uh, because Biden can say, see, I told you so. Right. That and it would also make that less of an issue. And then the second would be if there's some kind of a ceasefire agreement in the Middle East, which I think would also be very good for the for the Harris campaign. Norman, did you want to come in on, on this? Yeah, I, I was just going to add that I think um, if you know Harris becomes president, you can expect continuity from her when it comes to to Europe. And it was I think Senator Mark Kelly, who um, from Arizona, he was considered her pick, did say uh, earlier this month that. If she if she becomes president, Ukraine will get what it needs and that the U.S.'s role as a leader in sending military aid and of being the lead nation in the NATO alliance, that's not that's not going to change. So that that's going to be her their position on it. I think, you know, it's 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 quite black and white in that respect, whereas Trump has threatened to leave NATO. I mean, if he wins, I don't know what happens. I don't know if that, you know, I I. I, I don't know if um, you know that that if NATO would survive a second Trump term intact. I'm I'm not quite sure, but under Harris, I think it's it's the the, the status quo. Thanks. Come back to to you, the audience. I've got somebody just on the aisle there, and then a couple in the front row. Hi, thanks so much. I wanted to um, circle back to the question of youth and now uh, foreign policy because I'm um, teaching a uh, course on the U.S. election at the university um, starting in a couple weeks and already these students are so engaged and so, so excited and uh, similar to uh, how you described your uh, daughters as well. But what I want to ask you about is this tension because this is also precisely the demographic that is most concerned with um, the situation in Gaza, and we've seen this at the um, at the Democratic Convention with the considerable uh, protests there. So, could I get the panel's view on how you think that tension will uh, play out? Not least because it's particularly important in precisely these some of these battleground states. Um, Evelyn, just two behind that person. Sorry. Um. Yes, I think this is going to be uh, a turnout election, and uh, in 2016 the turnout was 60 percent. The last election was 66.6 percent, so that's about 33 to 40 percent of people that don't vote in the states. So, if you were to advise, hopefully, next President Harris to target those people, who are those people, and how would you get them to turn out? 
turn, turn yeah, off. Yeah. And then a couple right, right in the front row, um, second along from the end, and then, yep, thanks, Abby. Hi, I'm, I'm the product of uh, the Second War. My mother was Scottish, my father was an American soldier, met, he, met her at a tea dance. Uh, at, at 1942, as America entered the war, Frank Capra uh, made a uh, sort of a propaganda movie with John Huston narrating called Why We Fight, uh, which described the uh, rise in, in uh, Japan and Germany and, and, and Italy of, of the dictators. Uh, would you advise uh, them to bring that forward uh, in this campaign? And then just at, at the end. Thank you. I'll preface it by saying I can't begin to understand why any self-respecting woman, after his remarks about women, could vote for Mr. Trump. But that may be an old-fashioned view. I mean, that is unacceptable language, which if you used it in the workplace, might land you in a little spot of bother. However, my question is this. In respect to the judiciary and the importance of the rule of law and the role of the judiciary. How can you keep it out of politics in the States and above politics? Okay, f f four questions. Maybe, maybe there's some connections w within them, but who wants to take a stab at them? J Jason? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, oh, where do I start? Gosh. Um, I'll answer your question first. If, if if Joe Biden were still running, I, I think whether or not I'd advise him on it, he'd be talking about the threat of fascism because for Biden it was, just like it was in 2020, it was about uh, the anti-Trump sort of narrative scheme. Um, I don't think I'd recommend that for Kamala, not that I'm not scared of it, uh, but that's, you know, we've mentioned it, we're not changing anyone's minds on Trump. Uh, most people's minds are made up. The, the, the imperative now is to give that sliver of the, the electorate who doesn't like Trump, but has, at least with Biden, wasn't willing to say that they were going to vote for Biden, uh, is focusing on them. And that's not an anti-fascism message. That is a, uh, I know you mentioned it, it's a, it's a way forward message. Uh, and I, so I think I would probably recommend against that. Nomi, did you want to come in? Yeah, was there a question about Gaza? Sorry. Yes, uh, Gaza and yeah. really, really how, how young people and, and younger voters are, are maybe more engaged in, in, in those kinds of issues and, and does that, does that yeah. pay through in strategy? Well, um, after October the 7th, I, you know, we did go to Michigan and you know, there, was, there, was, there was a lot of anger towards uh, Joe Biden when he'd gone over to Israel, embraced Benjamin Netanyahu and... There was the protest vote against him in the primaries. Um, Harris, I think, wants to send a message about Gaza and Israel. I'm not quite sure what that message will be, but at the risk of sounding like I'm trying to give a dose of cold political reality, I'm not entirely convinced that Gaza is going to be, and please do correct me because um, you guys have the, the data, the polling that, that probably suggests otherwise, but just in my uh, sort of general experience, whilst the Democratic Party, it has divided them and it's, you know, something that they're all trying to work out within the party, voters actually have notably other issues that they really care about, the economy, inflation, abortion rights, immigration. I'm not saying that what's happening in the Middle East isn't a problem for younger voters particularly. I'm just... I'm not convinced at this stage how much of a deal breaker it is for her. I mean, for Biden, it looked like he could potentially have lost Michigan. That would have been a disaster for him. But I'm not quite sure where we are with Kamala Harris in that respect, probably because she's not massively defined her position on it yet. There was there was some there was some suggestion that she was going to have an arms embargo in Israel. And then then she said that's not the case. So. Until she gives a sit-down interview in which she lays out her policies quite clearly, it's really hard to see at this stage, I think anyway, how much Gaza is going to factor in for voters. I think mathematically, uh, I'm with you. I, 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 so um, 
of Arizona, Nevada, North Carolina, and Georgia. I don't think Gaza matters. I don't think the the low information voter that is decisive in any of those four states could find Gaza on the map. So I don't think it matters. Okay, uh, just to be about raw, they couldn't find Israel. Brute politics, right? <laughs> Of any of those states, the only one that it could change would be Michigan. I'm not sure it would. I don't know. I mean, I lived in Michigan as a kid, but, I mean, you have a, a number of Muslim voters in Michigan. I don't know if it switches the I, – I don't I, – I'm skeptical that it has I, – I still maintain that it's the economy that drives this election and perceptions of the economy, not the economy exactly. There's no, there's no one state – I mean, let's be clear. You add up – the entirety of the Jewish and Muslim populations in the U.S., and you might fill this building. It's not a it's, – it's so – electorally, I don't think it's going to matter. I don't think it's going to matter in Michigan. Um, I, I am every election cycle uh, stupefied at people who have a legitimate gripe and yet consistently vote against their best interests. And anyone who thinks that a President Trump is going to be better for the Palestinians than a president anybody else – probably shouldn't be voting. So uh, I think, um, let's see, and then there's the turnout question. That's, it's connected to youth. That's the, yeah. So I think there's the tur there's a turnout question. So keep in mind, the last election was very strange. We did it during the pandemic. People could mail their ballots in. It was, uh, it was a mess in many respects because we had a lot of fear about just gathering. It was just a mess. So I think, I, I, I don't know what the, likely turnout percentage would be. I, I can't imagine it's north of 66. I would guess it's below 66, but above 60. Um, but like, you know, I don't, I can't remember the exact. You're saying it was 60 and 66 percent. I can't remember the exact. Let's take the word for it. Well, t let's just say, <laughs> okay, so let's just say, so I don't think it would be higher than, but like, keep in mind, the campaign now is not one day in time. The campaign clock starts where you could start mailing your ballot in, and every candidate really? has a strategy to really? like to start getting basically banking votes. And the Republicans who were resistant on it last time out are not resistant on this time. So, it's I, I mean I think turnout's probably marginally lower than it was when basically everybody's sitting at home and could mail yeah. their ballot in. But maybe it was coming. Gaza thing. Um, I, when I went to Columbia University and covered the protests there, and uh, you know, spoke to all the university students, the question I kept asking them is: Is this a deal breaker? Are you going to not vote for for Joe Biden at the time? And they wouldn't commit to that. Uh, so you know, and I think some of them didn't want to say it's we're, we're not going to vote for him because as you, know, you mentioned that they know that the alternative, Donald Trump, is probably is is not. It's not like Donald Trump is a, is going to. Uh, be a friend to the Palestinians in the way they wanted. So I, I think that the, the sense that I got was that they would still vote for the Democratic Party, but they want they were hoping the protests that we saw over the summer would maybe change them to try and somehow change policy or, or change the Democratic Party's view on it in some ways. But I don't I, I think in the end for a lot of young voters, they I mean, I, I who knows, but I think for a lot of them, there are also other issues that 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 they might prioritize first when it comes to who they vote for, and then, I mean they wouldn't vote for Donald Trump anyway. So. They just wouldn't vote. No, I um yeah. I served on the board of a youth uh, voter empowerment organization called Empower the People, which came into existence shortly after the Parkland uh, shooting, uh, which now goes back what seven years ago, I guess. Wow. Um, uh, which was much more existential to young voters because it was literally their peers uh, who go to school every day and learn evacuation routes in case of a shooter and live shooter drills and things. Like, that was very, very much part of their existence. And if you think back to the protests that happened then, I mean, we're talking about millions of people came to Washington, massive march in Washington. There were, the, the nature of the protests then was different than the nature of the protests on college campuses, I think in large part fueled by, I refuse to call it X, fueled by Twitter, uh, and a lot of mis and disinformation. But my point is, Gaza is very far away. And, and let's be perfectly clear, and I'll just be transparent, I'm incredibly pro-Israel, I'm also incredibly pro-Palestinian and pro-two-state solution, and a ceasefire can't happen soon enough. But, uh, Nomia said it, 
this issue is not really an issue in the lives of young voters. Gun violence is, and youth vote was still down in the last three elections. We keep investing our hopes that, oh, this is the election. This is when the, the young people are going to vote. Young people don't vote. Just disabuse yourselves of any kind of notion that the youth are going to save us uh, at the ballot box. Young people do not vote. Right. And they, it's inexplicable to me, but they don't vote. Well, because they, they, they tend to move a lot, and that slows down their ability to find the polling places. So just to put uh, – to try to make some connections – from the election to this country and to the concerns about younger people. I want to tell one very funny story that illustrates the wider point, and then I want to talk about what younger Americans are also concerned about. So my son attends college at the University of Alabama. There was a pro-Gaza protest and then sort of a smaller um, pro-Israel protest. It was in the student green there, and then there was the bigger protest. The bigger protest, which was a lot of yelling of the students, was – they were angry that the, the two protesting groups were doing it in front of the Chick-fil-A, which is where they were trying to buy their chicken sandwiches for lunch. So, and, that, and my son, who is a good kid, kept quiet, but he was waiting in line for his chicken sandwich, and he was not happy that people were exercising their free speech rights in front of his chicken sandwich. Um, so we had to put – so those it's are – a good chicken sandwich. Just, it I is mean, a – It's a really good chicken sandwich. And they sandwich. make a mean iced tea. So like so but that so my point here is is there's brute force like real life economic things that that dominate people's existence. So I want to talk about a couple other things that are very important to young people right now um, that are not some of the hot button sort of globally relevant issues. This group is very well educated, very globally aware, but that's not the base of most populations, right? So one big concern with Gen Z, our kids are all Gen Z, is like getting a good job and where's the economy going and there's been some the cost of college yeah the cost of college there's been some recent polling showing concerns about layoffs from the new york fed that just came out yesterday um but then there's also the cost of housing especially buying your first house which is a real issue in the united states our multiple multiple on the average salary for cost of housing is so crazy i don't understand and i'm the math guy and, but it's a failure of the political elite to engineer a better solution to get more housing for people, to start building more. And so, like, that's a brute force reality of an issue that, you know, is, is really uh, concerning to people. And I think there's a housing, a related housing issue here as well. How do we build more units? We have a lot more single people. How do we build more units for single people living alone? So I think it's stuff like that that are it's, other big issues that we don't really talk about but are very important. Yeah. The question about justice and the judiciary. Well, Biden has a proposal that will never see the light of the sun outside of the committee room in which it currently sits to reform the Supreme Court to enforce an ethics code. Uh, I think I saw a 16 year term limit. Uh, there's been a repeated call over the years to expand the Supreme Court from nine to I think it's 15 or 13. Um, I don't think any of those are actually going to happen. Um, I do think I, I do think that Congress could force, and this gets into sort of what the next Congress looks like and whether Republicans or Democrats are in charge. Um, it's uh, it's a tragedy what the Supreme Court currently looks like. Um, I, most of my Republican friends don't feel dissimilar, uh, dissimilarly. Um, I don't see any reform coming down the pike anytime yeah. soon. Uh, you have to remember that every Congress f for the last 20 years has done less than the previous Congress uh, to the point where uh, I think now the re – uh, who is it? Is it Marjorie Taylor Greene? Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was Lauren Boebert was, uh, was uh, in an argument with someone, a debate on the floor. She's passed two bills, both of which were the renaming of post offices. We do that. Uh, apparently. Uh, so I, I think something like that would require uh, a, an amount of political will that I don't think exists currently. Um, yeah, we're just kind of stuck with them. So I think in terms of the judiciary, a couple points for the audience to, to consider. So during the Great Depression, when FDR had very large majorities, he tried what was then called the court packing scheme to increase the size of the Supreme Court. 
Americans rejected it then as sort of foul play or sort of like a, a sort of thinly veiled attempt to change the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court back then was more Republican and, and resisting some of the New Deal stuff he was trying to push through. So we've had attempts at court packing before. It didn't really go anywhere, even with super majorities. So I think there's that. I do think that there's it's an interesting question about in our system where you have three different independent branches of government – who you think is the most? Who you think is the most important branch of government and has the most power? Uh, I tend to lean towards the legislative branch. Uh, I think the legislative branch in the Constitution and our Constitution is given the most power, power of the purse, etc. Um, but there's some people have different opinions on that, and then their views kind of get expressed, right? And I think, and then finally, I would just say that it's really interesting to look at different Supreme Courts around the world. There have been some – there are some activist Supreme Courts now that I don't think we would necessarily – like the Brazil Supreme Court, which is very interesting. So I do think it's like – it's worth looking at what other Supreme Courts and other democracies have are doing too. And sometimes it's like the more activist Supreme Courts maybe could go too far too. I think, so this, I think this Supreme Court has been pretty activist. You would, you would consider them activists? Uh, I think throwing Roe v. Wade out uh, back to the states and giving the president immunity from all, I think that's pretty activist. I mean, that, both of those cases overturned decades of established law. I mean, they can't run away from that record, I don't think. Nami, do you want to come in on, on this as well? Yeah, uh, the Supreme Court endlessly fascinates me. Um, <laughs> we have a UK Supreme Court, but I couldn't even tell you who's on it. Um, whereas in the US, <laughs> The Supreme Court justices are almost like they, they're. I don't want to use the word celebrities, but they're known. They, they, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg obviously was, especially around here in DC, seen as a bit of a rock star. So, um, I, I, I do think it's become a political issue, especially because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the presidential immunity decision, um, and I, I, I think the Democrats have obviously use that to try and galvanize their base. I'm not quite sure how. I, I mean, anecdotally, again, I can you know tell you in, in my capacity as a reporter when I'm out, out and about, uh, Americans have become much more aware of the power of the Supreme Court and uh, you know how much of that motivates their uh, their reasons for voting. And if that is one of the, the the issues they're concerned about, I think that's become that that's increased in the last few years. Um, and you know, Donald Trump said that he would appoint. You know, he would overturn Roe v. Wade. He got to appoint three Supreme Court justices, which was a pretty phenomenal thing that, you, you, that he got that many opportunities and, you, you know, he overturned Roe v. Wade. Um, so <clears throat> I, I do find it like when, whenever I'm standing outside the Supreme Court broadcasting and, you know, the Supreme Court's to my right, Congress is to my left, I find it just remarkable that the Supreme Court, with no term limits, has, it seems, you know, more power than Congress where you have elected leaders. Uh, it is, I, I, and there is that question constantly, does the Supreme Court have too much power now? Well, they can, they can make rulings they can't enforce. That's the executive. They can't enforce the law. That's the executive branch. And they have no power of the purse. So it's, a, it's the power is divided up. Yeah, yeah but it ebbs and flows. I mean... Yeah. We probably don't have time for any more questions, but I'm going to take a couple more anyway. So, uh, because because I know that there's 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 a lot of interest. Person um, on on the end there. Yeah, we'll go with you. Hi, um, I currently work for an MSP. I'm originally from Buffalo. I've been in Scotland three years now. Uh, currently working on getting EU citizenship. Um, have you noticed a trend in young Americans like me who, basically, after being abroad for some time. They kind of look at the U.S. system. They go back. They're just like yuck, and, and it's not limited to the youth. <laughs> well, well, yeah. But then, I've you know I've talked about this at nauseum with European friends of mine. Why do you think so many Americans are basically content with just clawing for something that is the bare minimum here? So socialized health care comes out of my paycheck. I will gladly pay more if it helps the NHS. You know, gun violence. I feel safe here. You know, I don't think about that. So why do you think so many Americans are seemingly content to work against their own self-interest? And do you notice a trend among younger Americans, I'm 26, that maybe show an interest in moving abroad? I mean, that, that, that's probably a panel, a a panel session all in itself. Um, wow. I'll, take, I'll take, if they can be very, very short questions. The, a person with a hand up um, 
second from the far end, sorry. If you can pass it. Um, do you think there are any circumstances under which Trump would withdraw? Okay. <laughs> that would be the one, one, surprise, wouldn't it? Is that the blue pill or the red pill? I'm not sure which one that is. And, and one last question right at the front here. Yes, it's been a fascinating debate and a lot of things I was going to ask about have been asked about. But one thing I wondered about, I was picking up on um, Robert's point about the Republican Party in the Civil War. If Trump were to lose, what's going to happen to the Republican Party? That, that, that's a, maybe a great final question. So, so, so thank, thank you for that. So uh, do you want to kick off? Sure, and so we'll that's a great in? question. Um, so that you know where I'm coming from, you know, back in 2015 and 2016, I was not a Trump fan, uh, and I was very critical of him. I um, have a, a complicated think, thought process about him, but, like, basically, he, he if, if there wasn't Donald Trump, there would be some, my, in my view, there would be somebody else that would appeal in a populist way to a range of voters that felt like they weren't being listened to. And it would be from the left or the right. It happened to have been the Republicans, uh, but I think it could have been the Democrats as well. And so he just is sort of an advantageous thing, which is why I had referred to him as a parasite, which got misinterpreted. My point was like he was a like a virus that inhabits a host, and then right. So, you but that was—you've just given it a whole new news cycle. It was mis I know. But I mean, it was an interesting. So, so the question is, what happens if he loses? Um, so, first of all, the question is, if it's close and he loses, that's not great. Um, and uh, Jason and I have talked about like what would happen in terms of in the different states. Would you have protests or political violence? Possibly, yes. But if he loses, then later on, what happens to the party? I think the party, I don't think there's a going back to the party being sort of uh, free trade globalist kind of it, where it was during, say, Nixon to Reagan. Or let's actually say Eisenhower to Reagan because Eisenhower was the first globalist Republican. So it was sort of Eisenhower to Reagan. I don't think you see that. I think that it will stay Trumpian, if we could use that word. I think it would stay, it will stay uh, po it'll be nationalistic, populist, protectionist, etc. Now, the question is, is that a winning formula for them? Um, I don't like, I, I, I have problems philosophically with some of these positions. So I'm a capitalist and a free trader. So that, that's a challenge for me, right? Um, but I think that it could, from a political standpoint, that formulation, a Trumpian formulation, could be electorally very advantageous for them. The question is, then, can you win being Trumpy but not having Trump? And I think the answer is yeah, and I think it may possibly you don't have that ceiling, and it could actually be even more electorally advantageous for them. Again, philosophically, I have several different problems with this formulation, but I, do th I, I think it could be a good formulation for them if they're trying to win electoral power. And, and is there anything that would make Trump stand down? No. Okay. Jason. No, I used to say for, I think for about three years, I said to anyone who'd listened that the Republican Party was broken when Trump won the nomination. And I, I revisited that viewpoint. I think the Republican Party is realigned. Um, the question practically for this panel for me is, um, can Kamala Harris take advantage of that moment in time where there are Republicans who have not yet figured out where they stand vis-a-vis -vis that alignment, that realignment? Um, hope, my hope is that they still can't summit the Trumpian part, the Trumpy part of the Trumpian equation. Um, but I do think we are we are on yeah. the tail end of a, re, of a Republican Party realignment. Can, can I bring yeah. Nomi yeah. in on, on, on that? Yeah, I don't think Trump will stand down at all. I think what in terms of you know what happens to the Republican Party, I mean, I remember after January the sixth, there were I think ten Republican lawmakers that vote that that wanted to impeach him for incitement of insurrection. And there was this whole thing about are the Republican Party going to move away from him? And they, they didn't. You know, Ron DeSantis was seen as the next guy and uh, that they would potentially coalesce around him. They didn't. It, you know, the party is very much Trump's party. And that was evident at the RNC. I mean, it was like the crowning of a king. I think the more immediate thing is, will he 
if he loses, will he concede? Um, I mean, when he did his interview with Elon Musk, he did say something which was quite interesting. He said that um, if the election doesn't go his way, he'll run away to Venezuela or something. But um, I, I think, you know, that's that's certainly <laughs> what, um, you know, the, the, the sort of what, what, what will happen if Kamala Harris does win. And because we know he won't concede, but what will be the aftermath of that, I think, will be something that everyone will be watching. And I think I think we, we we don't really have time to do the question about why why young people maybe are, are becoming more and more di disillusioned with the lack of healthcare, the the, the, the gun violence, justice. But I, I will ask the panelists if you can sum up in a question in a sentence something that hints at an answer to that I think massive social and cultural question, um, and then then I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up. But Jason, do you want they to? get older and they figure it out. Uh, I, I mean that in the nicest way. Uh, I think young people are idealistic, and that's good. That's important. Uh, but then as young people get older and get confronted with more of sort of life's challenges and opportunities, they tend to get a little more circumspect. Um, I put a passport in the hands of both my children when they were we, you know, we big uh, because I wanted them to have a perspective. But, I mean... I love America uh, for all of its flaws and, and problems and compromises. Uh, uh, the young people, every generation goes through that period of questioning and pushing, and then they end up realizing why America is so awesome. So U.S. Gen Z is maybe little, like two ticks to the left of millennials, just politically sort of in their views. That's interesting. Uh, I think that... Um, we are all living in different democracies right now. And in a way, um, having them compete for citizens is not bad. Competition is good. And, um, you know, that's, and that's an important part of it. And so if people do want, I still believe in the free movement of people. So if people want to live in a different society, then that's great. That's why we have immigration policies. One last point very, very quickly for you is the, the next Republican Party is probably going to be pro-labor. Which is interesting. Okay. And Nomi, the last word to you. Um, I think a lot. It depends where you are in America. Bear in mind, there are some Americans that very much like living in America. Um, probably can't even afford to to leave America. But I, I think I think people want to leave because you know they do think that there are better opportunities, social programs, and like universal health care. But also probably to have a sense of adventure as well. Okay. I think we, we've, we've, we've come to the end. I, I think we probably could have continued this discussion in so many different different ways um, beyond what we have had time for this afternoon. But can I just say thank you all very much for coming along this afternoon. Thank you for your contributions. And sorry to all of those I didn't, uh, uh, didn't get to in, in terms of questions. Um, I'd like to just remind you, please, if you would, fill in the feedback forms. If you booked on Eventbrite, you'll get an automatic uh, link in, in an email, but we do have some paper copies at, at the back. It helps us improve the festival, take on board your comments and, and suggestions for, for topics or, or themes for discussion for, for future, future years. There are other events um, we are running and, and for the rest of the week that you might be interested in. On uh, Friday, there's a, a session on global politics and actually, no, that's tomorrow. Sorry, there's a session tomorrow on global politics. There's one on Friday as well. Uh, and and uh, digital literacy and, and um, privacy as, as well tomorrow. So do pick up a programme if you haven't already got one and have a look and see what else is in there. But can I end by thanking our panel very, very much to Robert, to Jason and to Nomia. Thank you for your contributions. Enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you too to our BSL interpreters.